W-A-F-L-M-O-Y-T. Yo, that stands for Let's Watch a Full Nice Movie on YouTube with Mike Spiegelman and Carl. Hi, Carl. Hey, Mike. How you doing? Good to see you, as Yo, always. As likewise. We are streaming at first on MutinyRadio.fm. What is MutinyRadio.fm? It's a streaming internet uh, radio station from San Francisco. Just type in MutinyRadio.fm, and we are on the schedule every Sunday. 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We are also a podcast and a YouTube video podcast, and you can find us both at our acronym, L-W-A-F-L-M-O-Y-T. We are going to watch with you a full-length movie on YouTube. Carl, what is the movie this week? Straight out of Frisco. We are wa- No, it's L.A. We are watching The Little Shop of Horrors. The Little Shop of Horrors, 1960. Okay, The Little Shop of Horrors, try not to sing the title, now, 1960. Now, this is very important. Carl, take it away. Okay, it's there are so many copies out there. Some of them are bad. Lots of them have ads. Some of them are black and white and color. So we want the channel Watch Now Sci-Fi Fantasy. So here's how you go. D- don't search for Little Shop of Horrors, 1960. You can if you want. Maybe you'll find it that way. But I would put in Watch Now I don't think you have to put in all the way sci-fi fantasy. Just watch now. Okay. Um, search. After your search, then you go to the filter on the right and choose channel. Right. After you choose channel and search, now it's going to come up. Watch now sci-fi fantasy. Okay, so this is a little bit different. We don't want you to look for the title. This title is everywhere. We want you to find the channel that's hosting the best copy. Go ahead and type in watch now. Like, remember your watch and then N-O-W. And then you will find Watch Now Sci-Fi and Fantasy. And they are hosting Lil Shop. And then from there, Carl, how do we find Lil Shop? Okay, so once you go to Watch Now Sci-Fi Fantasy, not in the top search bar because that's all of youtube but below it says home video shorts playlist community channels about and search Mm. you click on that search and right in there you put in the you got to say the little shop of horrors 1960. now is that a peck and hunt i'm hearing here we go little shop of horrors okay now wait 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 It's deceptive because their picture shows the popular 1986 version, okay? So even though it shows that, that is your version, okay? So you're going to want to click on that. You see like Audrey 2 choking uh, the life out of Audrey 1. Audrey 1, the human. Yes, in the picture. And it looks like it's the 1986 version. So So click on that, press pause, go back to zero. Is this a colorized version, Carl? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. We'll live. Uh, We'll live like you would prefer black and white? No, I don't care at this point. (laughs) (laughs) I think color is, look, I'm all with these kooks for like keeping films black and white and stuff. I really am. You know, it's the original, et cetera. But um, I don't know. We've got an audience to entertain, and it just looks prettier in color, and we're not the Library yeah. of Congress here, right? No, right. no, it's fine. We we accept colorized movies. Listen, if it wasn't for colorized movies, we would not have TCM, and we would not have a lot of movie, historical movies, archived, thanks to Turner. Turner just wants to make a buck, man. He bought yeah. all these movies. Hooch doesn't and- care. He's all about the food, going for yeah. a walk, but Turner... 
They want right. their when it comes to Turner and Hoots, Hoots doesn't care. But Ted Turner, he, he's oh. gonna colorize his movies, make some new money, he's gonna That's archive right. his movies, and because of him, we have a great library of movies. So yay, colorization. Okay, what a speech. Go watch now sci-fi and fantasy. Go search their uh, search engine for little the little shop of horrors 1960. When you find this epic, get rid of that ad, hit pause, move the timer to zero zero zero. When you hear press now or whatever, you go, go, go. It's go. Yeah, three, here, two, go. One, go. go. three, two, one, G O. Who's going to say it? Why? It's going to be a celebrity comedian. Carl, take it away. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Celebrity Comedian Countdown, this time with Jim McVeigh. Welcome, Jim. Uh, thanks for having me. <laughs> now, you are a comedian extraordinaire. You are out there on the scene. Now, you're just back from Colorado. Tell us what the comedy scene's like out there. Is it very different? What's the contrast? Uh, well... I was kind of in like the hood and the suburbs that didn't do any like clubs downtown or anything. So, uh huh. Uh, but my buddy John Mags does uh does some great shows. He's like filling rooms and doing you know some pretty cool alternative stuff. And I know he's got like a private event at the International Church of Cannabis, and they get super <laughs> high in there. But I mean, the town is weird as. There's like a the Rocky Mountains in the back, like majestic, and yet, you know, homeless people with catheter bags swinging around. Uh huh. Well, you gotta just glad I brought you on just to <laughs> cheer up our audience. Talk about the comedy scene, and we're hearing about homeless with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. With, so how is John Mags doing now? He we we know him from Scotty's. That's a place where you and I got to know each other. Uh, he went out there maybe two years ago, three years ago. How, how's he doing out there? You just said he's having great success with uh, being a producer. Well, yeah, he's hosting some shows. He's got a, a grandpa's house brewery and the International Church Comedy. That I mean, all the, the comics, the local people I met down there said he's got the best shows in town. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I guess maybe he was having trouble getting on stage and he decided to just, you know, put on better shows. And, uh-huh. Uh, yeah. His, his own. His jokes are fucking funny. He's just gotten way funnier. He's got like a really good following, and the, it, the community is is cool. I mean, I probably only met about like eight comics, but uh, between the couple shows, but mm-hmm. they were all really nice, really funny, different walks of life. So, you know, it's a little. It was refreshing, I guess. Now, I know that you're very serious about studying comics. That's why I see them all right there behind you. <laughs> Comics, ha ha! That was hilarious. Now, Jim, you took a bit of a hiatus from comedy for a short time. What, 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 what was that all about? And what brought you back to us? Uh, well, I'm super uncomfortable doing the, uh, you know, this type of thing. So I, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I didn't want to do any of those virtual shows or anything people were doing during lockdown, and. Uh, you know, just general depression and <laughs> uh, laziness, and um, but uh, I don't know. I just wanted to tell all the jokes that I'd been writing, hang out with the you and other my other friends that I've, you know, made doing open mics over the years. Now that now, okay, so. During that time in which you were taken off, you weren't inactive in terms of comedy because you've got this cartoon you're working on. It's a television show. It's a tell us about this robot. Tell us about the concept. Of, what, what are what are we going to see when this thing comes out? Uh, so, so uh, our buddy, you met him, uh, Daniel is Daniel Crow. He's a really funny guy from uh, yeah. Delaware who's always working, always, always on the road. Uh, it's got kind of, you know, dry <clears throat> sense of humor, personality sometimes. And I just always envisioned him like an emotionless android. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I developed this show, which he's a, <laughs> he's an android that wants to learn how to do, uh, stand up, uh, <laughs> to learn about emotions. So he goes from city to city doing, uh, you know, road work and, uh, somehow ends up fighting a monster just about every episode but 
you know, I worked really hard. You know, it's going to be cool. There's a nice uh, story arc and ties into some other cartoons I did. So it, it mm-hmm. should be funny. You know, every episode is going to have, you know, feature a funny friend of ours, um, do a few jokes and um, and then a cool action scene. My roommate and I make some cool music to it. So, you know, if you like uh, offensive stand-up comedy and science fiction and horror and uh, you want to laugh and, you know, see some crappy animations I made, then, then it's the show for you. <laughs> Who doesn't love it, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now the last thing I wanted to raise is something you'll object to. You won't appreciate me bringing up, but I got to do it. I got to do it. We all know the Oklahoma City bomber, okay? Timothy McVeigh. Tim McVeigh. And many times when you've been brought up as Jim McVeigh, people make comments about Timothy McVeigh, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it is the perfect marketing opportunity for you to be named Jimothy McVeigh. What do you say? Come on, James. It's fair. Uh, you've been trying this for about eight years. <laughs> uh, I'll reconsider. I'm the, <laughs> you know the other comic, uh, the other Jim McVeigh from San Francisco? Yes, right. Yeah, He's in talking. the city now, so, you know, maybe it's not. Really? Yeah. Maybe I should pitch him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. Uh so uh, about that cartoon too, if you want yeah. to find it, it's a uh, YouTube water closet cartoons with a K, not a C. Yeah. Water closet cartoons. And that's a channel on YouTube. Yeah, with a K. K-L-O-S-E-T, closet. Yeah, because apparently it's easier to Google search things that are misspelled. Listen, how can people uh, find you out there on the internet besides this YouTube channel, Water Closet Cartoons, like uh, follow you on Instagram, see what you're up to, what's your social media handles? Tell us now how to know to, what's going on with Jim McVeigh. Uh, I mean, I don't really have much lined up besides just working on my set, um, working on the cartoon in the meantime. Mm-hmm. I guess you can follow my Instagram. It's Jim J. McVeigh. And uh, I post pretty uh, irregularly. I think I uh, posted some of the Denver stuff in the last post for 2018. Uh-huh. Don't get too excited if you follow me. <laughs> okay, way to get them going. <laughs> All right. Okay, now, thank you very much, Jim McVeigh. Now, everyone at home is poised to watch this film at the same time as we do here in the studio. So everyone at home must press play on their device at the same time we do right here in the studio. So why don't you go ahead, Jim McVeigh, and give us that celebrity comedian countdown. Three, two, one, engage. Thank you, celebrity comedian, for that celebrity comedian countdown. I look forward to listening to it. But uh, it. But yeah, we have your 1960s typical soundtrack. We couldn't get uh the Peter Gunn guy. Right, exactly. They're basically doing a dragnet parody here. Right. Look at this. I love this drawing. I mean, I know it's yeah. super cheap to do, but yeah, this drawing. is Skid Row. And the music we're hearing was a bit of a scam. Roger Corman got kind of got scammed because the the guy, his name is Fred Katz. He would just take sc scores he's already given to Corman in the past and retitle it and give it to him and he would pay him. So, wow. yeah, this score that we're listening to here, it's all chopped up and moved to different places. But there were seven Corman films this guy scammed Corman with. This is the soundtrack of seven other films of Corman. No, why didn't he notice? So there's Jack Nicholson's name. I don't Corman know didn't why he didn't notice. He really should have. This movie is a very famous film because uh, I'm a big fan of Roger Corman. I think I was introduced to the crazy world of bad movies thanks to him. Yeah. When I was 12, <clears throat> I even did a Roger Corman film festival at the Montclair Public Library when I was Great. 12. Great. And we watched this movie, we watched Bucket of Blood, we watched Night of the Living Dead, but the librarian took the second reel out. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> it's Yeah. So what I know about this movie is that there was a movie set. They were going to strike it. And Corman said, hang on a second. That's and right. He, he made this movie. In like now, here days. we have Mushnik's Flower Shop. Now, you see how good the color is, right? Yeah, it's not noticeable. Now, there was a 1987 colorized version that was pretty bad. Now, this is Mrs. Shiva. And she's always coming for funeral flowers. Oh, because he's sitting Shiva. Yeah. Well, you would like maybe, as usual, some flowers for the funeral. Oh, who's making that oh, noise? Come on, we're trying to be solemn here. You all my funeral business. Now, on the right here is Mushnik, and he is a hero of the story. He's not our main character, of course. That will be Seymour, right. but he's really a major player. And he's so funny, man. It's a really good job he does. His name is Mel Wells, and um, he's doing like a Turkish-Jewish accent. Now, this is shot in 1959, so it's like really before – I mean, was Jackie Mason around? Like it was the time yeah. in which it's like there was no um, – Sid Caesar was around on TV, so there was plenty of okay. Jewish comedy. Now here we have Dick Miller, everybody's famous favorite, famous yeah. person, Dick Miller. You're right. I'm watching that movie, that guy Dick Miller, where they, they <laughs> talked to him right before he passed. Unfortunately, you know he died. Oh, uh, yeah, I do know. Yeah. Um. Let's see. When was that? How come it doesn't reach out and get, oh my gosh. Oh, here he is. Dick Miller died in 2019. So that's pretty recent, yeah. but he did miss the pandemic. God bless him. The, the <laughs> dentist is calling up and trying to order flowers. And of course, Mushnik, that, that's the writer's father, by the way, sitting in the chair with his 1950s haircut. Nice. The writer is all over this thing and his, his grandma's in it. His dad is in it. <laughs> <laughs> he does the voice of the plant. He pretends he he does the he's a robber. Look how the dentist so, patient is holding the equipment. Yeah. So the I guy's hate it, but... he's like trying to order a fern and some gladiolas, and Mushnik's trying to say two ferns and a dozen gladiolas. He's like, no, Mushnik. He's trying to beef up the here's our hero. Here's our hero, Seymour, and we will see more of him. <laughs> <laughs> now, Seymour is a ne'er-to-do-well. He is a klutz. He's a dunce. He's he's uh, stupid. He's everything that makes him, at his, you know, I'm a man age, work in a flower shop. Okay? He deserves his part. Look at his face as he's giving him instructions. He's trying to think about what he's saying. Uh, okay. Here's my friend. Yeah, let's you give a listen. Up? Yeah. Although there's not much funny at this point. We'll give a listen in a second. He's just going to order some carnations. Now, uh, in the musical movie, this Bill Murray had his role. Um, No, I think Bill That's Murray it. was the dentist patient. No, no. Oh, the bit. No. Oh, all right. Well, who, okay, who so played this role? He, this is the, nobody. This role doesn't exist in the see basically it's like Seymour, you're fired. And he goes, but I made a new plan for okay, let's listen to this joke. Well, that Seymour is oh, here are your carnations. Here's Wait, your carnations. Well, that's all right, I'll eat them here. I'll eat them yeah. here. Why not? <laughs> of course. Of course. Now look, he pulls yeah, out his right. own salt. Well, I've had well, this is a small shop. <laughs> That's okay. You know, those big places, they're full of pretty flowers, expensive flowers. And when you raise them for looks and smell, you're bound to lose some food back. I like these little out of the way places. Such a thing, eating flowers. <laughs> Look, don't ruin my sale, Now, yeah, baby. people asked Dick Miller, like, did you really eat flowers? And the answer is yes. Now, okay. there are some flowers you can't eat a carnation is perfectly safe to eat okay if you eat a poncetta you'll die stuff like that but in order to prove it in interviews he would come with a flower in his pocket and people go did you really eat a flower and he would pull out the flower and eat it and go yeah it was 
So when when do you think that interview was? Like in 1996? He still has his little Shabahara's flower waiting for that question? <laughs> Great question, because this thing was not popular immediately. Okay, Dick Miller genuinely ate flowers in this movie. Dick Miller was frequently asked if he ate flowers on more than one occasion. He devoured a bloom in front of stunned interviewers to prove that it wasn't movie <laughs> magic. So I don't know when. Yeah, no, it probably... Now it's like, Seymour, I've had enough of you. You're fucking fired. A surprise plant just for you. I'm growing a plant like you ain't never seen before. He's okay. making Excellent. a surprise I plant. The plants I got in my shop. Oh, well, yes. That's the killer plant. That's right. See, now this is Dick Miller's role. If he's got a new plant, you ought to look at it. For 200 years, but I got one shop on Skid Row. One. He goes, I've eaten plants all around the world, and I find... <laughs> That the plant shops with exotic plants draw people in, and while they're in the store, they eat. They, I'm sorry, <laughs> he didn't say that. I, I said that by mistake. They buy, they buy once they're yeah. in there to look at the other. And once you get that foot traffic, they'll sit at the counter and eat. <laughs> they stayed to buy. The owner got rich. No, he scratched himself to death in an insane asylum. Oh, that was my cousin Harry. So oh, RIP, every time somebody it reports that somebody died, Miss Shiva's like, "Oh, that was my cousin Mushnik." <laughs> Mushnik. I made that up. I made yeah. that. Up. No, no, no. Look what he did to the gladiolas. Whoa! Oh, come on, Jonathan Hayes. So he says, "That's right. His name is Jonathan Hayes, and he was discovered by a guy who was doing a move at a gas station." He put, look oh. at this piece of shit Skid Row house. Now, are we in Los Angeles? We're in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah, Skid Row. We are in the real. Now, as you know, I did a lion's share of my childhood growing up in Los Angeles. As a native and, of Los Angeles. Los right. Los and I Angeles. lived in Skid Row. Oh, yeah, that's right. I remember your place. What a dump. What a dump, right? But my father was a poor psychologist at a local college. And... <laughs> okay. Now, here is. Uh, mom. and mom is all about i'm a hypochondriac that's her whole comedic point throughout the film it's really not very good but she is the writer's grandma <laughs> so instead of doing like a we usually have a boobs list every time we see a set of boobs we write down yeah. one so maybe we could do like little shop of holler but horrors writers parents uh writers family <laughs> well so we so could do the two. writers involvement count yeah so we're at two right we're at two okay let's do that writers involvement <laughs> all right writer two now he was he was just pumping gas and a guy who was making like the monster of the deep or some crap came by and said hey you've been pretty good and and roger corman liked him um here let me tell you um Hayes was working at a gas station in California when he was discovered by Wyatt Ordung. Ordung. Ordung was directing a monster movie, A Monster from the Ocean Floor in 1954, coach, yeah. being produced by Corman, and he offered a small part to Hayes. Corman, three years Hayes' senior, was impressed and cast him in many films. And, of course, I got a list here, you know. Um all these all these people were seeing their they're Corman regulars, you know, and they were all in Bucket sure. of Blood and stuff. Well, that's the thing. So there's a Bucket of Blood trilogy I remember as a kid, which I don't remember the third movie, but it's basically saying that Corman had two two to three days to shoot a movie on a set. Mm -hmm. And this was one of them. And then yeah. Dick, Dick Miller did Bucket of Blood, which he I did. love. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, Dick Miller was going to be Seymour. And it was oh. Dick Miller himself who said, no, come on, give it to Johnny. Okay, Johnny's never been a lead. He's really good. So Dick Miller talked himself out of, he talked himself out of this film, which wasn't a dumb move. It was, you know, it was the Corman it's, gang. They were always yeah. making films. Give him this one. Well, he's great in Bucket of Blood, Dick Miller. So he, he definitely earned his stripes uh, as a now lead. That'll be our next film. film, right? I hope so. There's Look, the old Temptation Club. Up. I remember these days, man. Oh, you walking around Skid Row? Oh, absolutely. Why? This was, <laughs> boy, oh boy. This is the 200 block of East 5th Street between Los Angeles Street and Wall Street, remember? 
Love I mean, it. Who could forget? <laughs> the truth is, okay, this here is not, this is really the Bucket of Blood set. This is not on Skid Row. This is an interior. Now, they're talking about how quick this was shot, and they're being impressed. And everyone's like, they shot this in two days. Right. But the truth is, it really took 11 and a half days to shoot by my calculation, okay? Okay, well, break it down your calculations. Okay, they had three days of rehearsal. Nobody counts that. That's That counts, right? You had to yeah, like SNL, you got Monday night, you pitch the ideas to Shaq. Tuesday, right. you write it. Shaq rejects it. Wednesday, you rewrite it. Right. Thursday, you're on set practicing. Yeah. Okay, then it was time to shoot, and they had two days and one night to shoot the – no, 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 not two. They did it in two and a half days. Two days and one night, they shot the interior – and then they spent two weekends doing the exterior. So that's four days by my calculation. So three days plus 2.5 plus two equals 11 and a half days to shoot this thing. That's still remarkable, but it's not yeah, as braggy right. as everybody sure. wants to Sure, and then one thing I didn't realize when I was 12 and I realize now is that it's really unfair to the crew, right? I mean, it's cool. He's got a passion and they're going to create this artistic thing, but their crew must have been on the set for like 24 hours a day or something. Why, why do you always go there? Like the, like actors and crew there. This is the movie business. They want to be there. They want right. nobody okay. saying, oh my God, watching okay. the clock. <laughs> sure, yeah. I can't wait to get home. Oh, got to make an entire movie in three days. That doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> but it, it is, I tell fun. you, I'm sure that Jonathan Hayes was way into it. And Aub Audrey here, I, I just can't see a world in which they're like, this is unfair. We are being forced to be in movies. <laughs> well, I mean, now there's unions and stuff. They wouldn't allow it. They're, okay, that's true. And that's another thing, you know. This was shot at the very last second of 1959 because the rules were going to change for oh. actors. They were going to get a better cut. And so Corman was squeezing in to the last seconds of 1959 before the rules changed on January 1 of 1960. Huh. So, all right. So I wasn't too far off. He was aware of it. I mean, it was exciting stuff. You read about this and you're like, God, I can't believe Corman made a movie, you know, within a week or something. And then it's like, well, it, it must have been kind of hectic. I'm sure, but okay. He, okay, uh, here it is. Um, Corman shot the film quickly in order to beat the changing industry rules that would have prevented producers from buying out an actor's performance in perpetuity. Whoa. January 1960, new rules were to go into effect, requiring producers to pay all actors residuals for future releases of their work. Now, you know Corman doesn't want that. No, of course not. So uh, before the rules went into effect, Corman decided to shoot one last film and scheduled it for the last week in December of 1959. Jesus, during the holiday week? The last... Oh! Oh! That's a fear! Okay, now... He has discovered that the plant likes blood. By cutting himself, it dripped in. Now he's... Oh, there it is. He's dripping in blood. Look at young Jim Henson doing his magic. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jim Henson directed the 1986 one. Frank Oz. Frank Oz directed the 1986 one. Oh, excuse me. You're thinking, I'm thinking Gonzo, right? Isn't it Frank Oz? Now look, he fed him. Oh, that's... Now everyone's all happy, and why? I don't know. It could be because the plant totally grew. It's Overnight? Like, yeah, from me drinking blood. So it's like, congratulations, you're keeping your job and a $2, a two a week raise. Not bad. Look at his what fingers is... all bandaged up from cutting. He goes, what? Look, look, the plant. Oh, boy, look at that. It's grown. Wow, it's really grown. Yeah. Isn't it empirical? It grows like a cold sort from the lip. <laughs> There's like a puppeteer under that table this whole time. Look at Jonathan Hayes' crotch. 
<laughs> now, right now, these two girls saw the sign in the window, the Audrey two or Audrey Jr. And so they're coming to check it out. That's it just turns out that they are from high school and their school has a float in the Rose Bowl bowl parade so they need they have two thousand dollars to spend on flowers but they're not thinking about doing it here watch mushnik talk them into it we don't have any of our own <laughs> he's looking at my flowers that's a tight suit he's wearing i like the suit mm-hmm. that's right. who died the chamber of commerce well we're from cookamonga we're building a float for the rose bowl parade which is made oh. out of flowers. Ding, 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 ding. and we're on the committee so right the but he's like consider us flowers. Yeah, it comes with Rick Moranis. <laughs> you know, Carl, I talked to you before we started the show that you never saw those god awful Little Shop of Horror musical Broadway show ads that plays in perpetuity on uh, nonstop, nonstop. Yeah. Uh, in the tri-state area in the 80s. I remember that the ads existed, but I don't think I had the emotional reaction. I remember, little shop, little shop of horrors at the Blah 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 Theater. I remember. At the Blah 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 Theater. What they did was like, people would be walking out of Blah 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 Theater. I had the greatest time. Mm -hmm. But the best line, and you know, Carl, maybe we could play the YouTube video at the end. Uh, (laughs) Okay. All right. All right. I'll do that. I'll save it. Now Mushnik is like, you, you're my son. And he starts to fantasize about how they're going to be rich in Beverly Hills shop. I, listen, he's a really funny actor. We will be rich, us. I am building for you a giant greenhouse in which you are making impossible flowers, which in turn I am selling at ridiculous prices ridiculous. in my giant new flower saloon in Beverly Hills. Do you see that big sign in the sky? Look at his spooky face. Now, I see, I see sometimes Mark Hamill in Jonathan Hayes' face. I do, too. That's so funny you to mention. It's, it's, yeah, because he's very expressive. You know, he still has, he has that kind of, like, innocent uh, panic to him. Now, there's this one scene in which he's hiding in a junkyard of toilets, and his head sticks up through one of the toilets, and that's when I first saw Mark Hamill. And I'll point it out at that time. Look at him. He kind of does look like him, right? His eyes and his mouth is small. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Like like Corvette Summer kind of look. Yeah. Well, so now Mushnik is getting crazy. And he's like, see, before she goes, Miss Shiva is like, I give you so much business. Maybe you'd give me a cut rate. And he goes, what cut rate? I'd be cutting my throat. I have a power shop on skin row. And now he's giving for free these carnations. Oh man, the mother's <coughs> gonna be so pissed. Yeah, but but the plants got a problem. She's they're about to find oh, out. My uncle Marsh's brother, Yankel, die. Tenafly, New Jersey. Tenafly, New Jersey. You should also give some flowers to that poor dead Even the, especially in the fifties, New Jersey was a punchline. Dead plant, look at Mushnik's face. He's such a good actor. What happened to my plant, Dad? Who are you calling Dad? Who, who? who are you calling Dad? And it was so beautiful. Before he was like, you were my son. Excellent. Just a few seconds ago, I gave away dozens of carnations. Free to Mrs. Shiva. I didn't mean it. And you have perhaps an explanation. Oh, but if you give me a minute, I'll think of one. So. <laughs> well, okay. You see what's going on here. It's great. Um, Let's give props to Corman. About, am I keeping my job or not? And if this plant does well, he's keeping his job. And it will in the end for bad reasons. Corman's a good director. I mean, you, he's moving the camera around. He's getting framing them. Well, in the right spot. okay, but he's got a lot of criticism for how this was shot. This was shot kind of sitcom style. Sure. Okay? So he had three fixed cameras he had two camera people, not a third, and he would, boom, he would, you see how we just tilted and moved with the camera? Yeah. So there wa- they weren't always static shots. Now he's hearing it talk. You said that. You can talk. I got a talking plant. Say it again. Beanie. 
Beep, beep. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. I've never been to college and I ain't been around much. But I've been this like is the, the no voice a of the writer. Three. That's Three. right. I'd like to feed you. But I used up all my fingers. Well, feed what? Feed, me. I'm feed him. I'm pieces. But maybe I can find another drop here someplace. Okay, so their intention was in editing to do a voiceover with a great voice for this plan. So the sure. right on set was off stream going, feed me. And then say, say that again. He goes, feed me. You know, so <laughs> they were in the editing room and they said, you know what? I, I, I like it. It's funny. It gets, everyone's laughing at it. Like they would hear the voice and laugh in the editing room. So they kept it. Good job. Look at that ass. So <laughs> yeah, that's you are so that is homoerotic. Now these are real bums. Is okay, that the right is word? Real skid, winos. Yeah, skid row, but winos. They were paid 10 cents a piece to be in. This is really skid row. It's real winos, and they were spent. This is the Southern Yard Railroad. Let me just wow. look it up. And they got to shoot here by giving the guy the like the Two bottles of scotch. Huh. Okay, now, Seymour is like a 14-year-old kid. So he just starts throwing rocks at a bottle. Unbeknownst to him, there's a dude under there. Oh, no. Is So let me guess. He's going to clobber the skin yeah. guy. Hey! Oh. Oh. Now, that was not Jackie Coogan. You know, the child actor? Sure. That was his okay. brother. Oh, is that Flacky? It's, uh, uh, Mackie. It's Robert Coogan. How funny. Now, look, he stumbles onto the tracks. Now, see that? They did it see backwards. What? The train is coming. They, they convinced the train guy to drive it backwards. Crazy. Yeah, doesn't that really look like it got mushed? Uh, up into the actual point. I mean, there's no money shot, but yeah, no, it did look like That's it. That's right. There's no money shot. And basically he stood, the train started backing up. Then he got down to his knees and rolled on his side. Crazy. Well, it did a good job. Give it up for Robert. Now, Robert Coogan was, uh, he made his film debut in Suki and Skippy in 1931. Jesus. Uh, he reprised that role. Uh, he was in about a dozen films, but his brother was sure. the real Hollywood star. We we seen some films with Jackie Cook, and I'm trying to remember what age he was in them. That's right. We saw them when he was grown up. Yeah. Now, okay, look, you're at a train. This is a real hearse and a real dead body, by the way. That no they see the foot. You see the foot? That's so crazy. Oh, well, he, <clears throat> I see the foot now in the bag. Okay, now, you're at the train yard. A hobo, he's actually the tr an, an, a, a train detective, believe it or not. But nonetheless, he stumbles onto the tracks and gets hit by a train. Did, he, did Seymour really kill him? Why should he take the body to go hide it? Do you know what I mean? If the cops come, they're going to see some poor sap got hit by a train. They're not going to think... Well, he threw a rock at him. Yes, it, know. we know, and Seymour knows that he led to he 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 didn't kill anyone. He bonked a guy in the head with a rock by a mistake. So, is he who's in the bag? Who's in the bag? See, that's the thing. He didn't do it to feed his plant. He's just now putting two and two together. Hey, I could, I could give you a snack. Maybe just a snack. Sure, I have a dead body right here. But you see, it kind of doesn't make sense as a film, but we'll just blow past it because he didn't need to do anything with that body. <laughs> Look what he's doing here. The hand. Cool. That's what a dead body hand looks like, by the way, Carl. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is so funny. This is mostly right, at dinner. Up. I call that salad. What do you call that salad? Cesarean. Well, before the next course, I think I'll have a nice cigar. All right? You would like maybe a cigar? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a cigar. I'm thinking about better than matches. 
Now look, he's discovering he doesn't have a wallet. I'm looking for the matches, and I found I left the money in the suit. I love how he gets away with smoking a cigar in the middle of a meal. It's 1959. You don't have yeah. any money? <laughs> she overheard. Is new. All right, all right. I made a mistake. Hey. After all, a man is entitled. Go on, it's your story. I'll wait for the punch. Oh, that's now, me at the moment. Like talking you know with it. In my shop in the cash register, I'm having the total day's receipts, which is summing up to more than nine dollars. Mm. You'll bring the rest of the food, then I'll go to the shop and get the money. <laughs> You're playing my favorite song. <laughs> now look here, Buster. One of you is going to go down right now and get the loot, while the other one stays here until the. You are having hostages. <laughs> Oh, fine. In this fancy schmancy restaurant, you are holding hostages, right? All right. All right. Fancy I think schmancy. he was making fun of his accent there. You eat yeah. I'll be back. Oh, he's great. What I was trying to say earlier is this is like today, a guy talking with this like Jewish foreigner accent is very common. But back then it was like just getting born. With the jet, there was no um, Mel. Um, who made Young Frankenstein? Brooks. There was no Mel Brooks out there in our. You well, know, no, there was. He was writing for the show of shows with Sid Caesar, which was also you know Jewish ethnic humor. Okay, so he's. I know, but I'm saying it wasn't main. It was just now getting born mainstream. Sure. This was sure. a new, fresh thing. Okay, so mean. he's now witnessed Seymour feeding blood out of a you know a dead foot to the plant so he's gonna act 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 and he's gonna demand to get drunk You're listen to this out, right bring me whiskey rum wine gin bourbon what? scotch rye tequila sake manashevitz did you bring the money <laughs> don't bug me with the money i got to get drunk now what flipped him i don't know Take it. Bring me anything. Bring me everything. Creme the mint. Everything you got. Okay. <laughs> I'm What happened? Don't ask. Now, Audrey what always said it pronounces words man. wrong, Don't and it's ask. a running Don't gag. Me. Maybe I could help you. Help you couldn't. Now, in the musical movie, it was, uh, who was, it was, what's her name? Who played who Audrey? Played Audrey? <laughs> yeah. God. You blanked on a name. I'm blanking on a name. This Audrey went on to be in Police Academy 2 and 4. I really? Know you yes, love was. Yeah, I know. I'm very familiar with their first assignment and Citizens on Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> right? she, was also, four. she was also the voice of Melody and Josie and the Pussycats. Josie and, and the Pussycats. And got something with a girl. Something with that. Check out their tats. Josie and the pussy cats. Check and out the their tramp stamp. Okay, he's come <laughs> to find huge success because after he fed him an entire corpse, whoa, did he grow. Now, Dick Miller said, I don't want the main part, but make sure I hang around the entire movie. Well, he does play a pivotal role in Seymour keeping his job. Now, look, there's the writer. Oh, darn. Uh, I want you to see to the left... Oh, darn. The writer is in the scene right now, okay. checking out. There he is. He just walked past. You see him there with the trench coat? Yeah, creepy guy. Okay, so that's four. Um, What was I telling you? Okay, it was Gremlins and Gremlins 2. Audrey, her name is Jackie Joseph. Okay. She shows up. Okay, this is very funny. You got to hear this. I got a tooth. What do you want to talk about? Dead plant. Is that a nice subject for to talk? For the plant is great. It's, it's four times bigger than it was yesterday. I saw, I saw. How come the plant is now so big? Oh, I don't know. But oh, you know. Dead there. body, you know. Right. But open a half hour, we already done $70 worth of business. 85. Look, Seymour. <laughs> you gave this plant a fancy name, Audrey Jr., but I want to know right now, what do just people call it? Well, it's a cross between a Butterworth and a Venus flytrap. Venus, Venus flytrap! Oh, every florist knows that's bad news. As it eats insects. It eats them three times in its life, and then it's full grown. Excellent. And how many times is this one eat? Well, once or twice. 
You don't remember? Well, this is kind of an unusual type fly trap. That is a possibility. <laughs> I never eat again. I don't see how it could get any bigger. Then you think it don't need any more flies. <laughs> Which means human beings. Right. He's hearing the oh, money. My tooth is just killing me. Oh, I forgot that he had a toothache in this movie. Yeah, now he has a toothache for no reason but to go to the dentist. No reason. Uh, there's no... Okay, so right. Mushnik was going to go to the cops and say, I have a murderous employee and a plant eat a, a carnivorous plant. But now he's like, I'm making money and it's probably not going to eat anymore. So what's the harm? I'll yeah. just make my money. Listen, it's only one skid rower. Her name is Jackie Joseph, this Audrey Fulquard. And she got on a plane and they told her that they were making um, like a detective movie. And then when she came back, it was like, nope, we're making Little Shop. Oh, how funny. Well, the thing got written. Okay, the right. that's the writer. That's the writer. Okay, so right, that's four. five. Five. Five writer things so far. Oh, Carl, I should mention something about, um, I don't remember the actor's name, the actress's name, but there's a famous uh, British actress, beloved. She goes on talk shows like Graham Norton and talks dirty uh -huh. and uh, lesbian. But she was in the musical movie, Little Shop of Horrors, as the dental assistant to Steve Martin. Oh, I remember her. She was very good. She wrote a biography, like a memoirs. And in the memoirs, she says that Steve Martin was very rude and physically hurt her. Like, actually, you know, physically pushed her and stuff like that. And it was not a pleasant experience. Yeah. And both Steve Martin and the director Frank Oz went on the record saying, that's not true. Look, I have the receipts to prove everything was very professional. Like, they immediately had several paragraphs to, to say that it's inaccurate. Right. So, who knows? You have to well, watch the, the movie. Is Steve Martin, <clears throat> as you know, I am a huge Steve Martin fan. He is hilarious. And I'm a fan of his stand-up. I'm a fan of his films, except for the sellout bullshit. But, you know. Yeah, and, a lot of but sellout. But it's no, he is notoriously known. Is that the right word? He's infamously yep. known as an asshole. Yeah. And oh, no, I get it. Now, I have always been like. I'm, I want to see the artist, what he says. Here's my art in my gallery. I kind of don't care about the behind the scenes, which is good for Steve Martin because he is just, everyone says what a jerk he is. So, Well, obviously we love the behind the scenes. We wouldn't be watching movies and talking about it if we don't like look in the peak behind the curtain. But yeah, you're right. You know, there's some times you should not know your heroes, right? Right. Okay, now. This dentist is just being a sadist. And so he's dueling him and boom, he kills him. Does it make sense? No, wait a minute. Hey, doesn't he have another patient? There he is. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Now this is some B character, character actor person. I don't know who it is, but. Uh, well, during this time, he was a B movie actor, Jack Nicholson. He was in Corman films galore, including a lot of great Edgar Allan Poe movies. Right. And, you know, he did a lot of uh, biker movies. And I think he co-wrote, didn't he co-wrote Easy Money? Um, we know he he co-wrote our favorite movie, Head, the Monkeys movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this, you're right. He had done, he was not known. He had only done two films for Corman. And Corman didn't even want him in this scene. So Nicholson reports, I couldn't play it straight. I went on the shoot knowing I had to be very quirky because Roger hadn't originally wanted me. I couldn't play it straight, so I did an awful lot of weird shit that I thought would make it funny. Today, so you'll have to come back tomorrow. Oh, I couldn't do that. I have three or four abscesses, a touch of pyorrhea, nine or ten cavities. I lost my pivot tooth, and I'm in terror. He's pretending that... See, the truth is he loves pain, and he loves to be at the dentist. Right. And that was that was Bill Murray as the patient in the musical. Yes. Yeah. All right. But I don't. Uh, well, in the cinema musical. In the cinema, I, right? Not the long-running Broadway play musical. Look, he's reading a magazine called Pain. Sure, Pain Weekly. You, know, you got to give it to Corman. Like this birthed the play, which birthed the cinema, which birthed 
a uh, Saturday morning cartoon, which burst really? comic books. There's yeah. a Saturday morning cartoon of Little Shop of Horrors? Yeah, one season it ran. Wow. Um, let me just tell you. What, oh, no, Corman, what? Did, Corman did good. And, you know, it's funny because the musical kind of is campy. You know, it's a celebration of these kind of cheesy movies. And, uh, you know, the love story in it, I guess. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the love story is you know, precious, a short-lived animated cartoon TV series, Little Shop, inspired by the music of the film, premiered in 1991, ran for one season on Fox Kids, 91. Uh, there were 13-year-olds. The plant was called Junior. It was born of a prehistoric fossilized seed. They would okay. have rap videos. Oh, 1991 rap videos, Saturday morning yeah. cartoons. <laughs> Old school. This movie is so funny because it is very short film, right? It's an hour and ten minutes. Yeah. So what does that mean for us, the the viewer? We get this Jack Nicholson stick in the middle of the film. We're in and out. So now he pulls a tooth. Now he will bonk over the dental thing, and Nicholson reports. See that right there? Yeah. Corman hops in, sets it up right, and says, that's a cut. They never <laughs> filmed the ending. They just went right to the scene. He's like, thank you. I will come back. Here comes their joke. Did that's you get it? forever. My punchlines are shorter. My setups are a lot shorter than that, Carl. That's how long that joke was. Feed me. Dracula, what do you think I'm carrying here? My dirty laundry? I got Jack Nichol. I'm literally carrying Jack Nicholson in this. No, it's the dentist. It's the dentist. I had to carry Nicholson. This should be enough for anybody. Feed me. Don't worry. We'll, we'll change your coat. Look at that cost. That's so. You may have been a crummy dentist, but you were a nice fellow. I love these puppets. Anybody in my and it isn't even Jim Henson. Uh, Nicholson was inspired by Jack Dimason. He was one of an actor in the 40s. Um, okay, the film was the basis for the off-Broadway musical adapted to the 1986 feature film. Uh, in 2003, it had a Broadway debut. 2019 oh. was Broadway again. 1995, the movie was adapted as a three-issue comic book series, which was released by Roger Corman's Cosmic Comics. Oh, right. That was classic, right? Right up there with Image and Dark Horse. Now, the reason we're watching this is because it is in the public domain. You see, Corman put this out. It was at the Cannes Film Festival. Huh. I, I don't know. He didn't believe in it, so he never bothered to copyright it. Which is crazy because he cranked this movie out to take, to exploit the workers, right? So they won't get any Bullshit. residuals. Okay, well, watch uh, his cigarette. Watch his cigarette. To no, exploit the workers? Not to exploit. Let me, let me phrase it this way. He saw a loophole. He realized he had a week yes. to get these acts. Because then he didn't have to pay residuals. But he never copyrighted this movie. So he doesn't get any money off of this anyway. Watch the I mean, cigarettes. Yeah, that's right. He never did. Watch the cigarette. Oh, we missed it. We missed what it. Happened? It just jumps around. It just jumps around. Sure. Now, okay. Joe Fink, is that supposed to be a dragnet thing? Joe Friday? Yeah. One of them is named uh, Fink, and the other one is named... Where is it? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. They have funny cop names. He goes, right. I'm a Fink. He goes, wait a minute, look how big it is now. Seymour! <laughs> you Seymour. killed another. Seymour plant. Joe Fink, and he's the narrator, too. There's a narrator? Yeah. Oh, that's, right, that's right, in the beginning, that's right, I remember. I am a, I am a detective. Now we're going to have some romance. Audrey, you don't have to Suddenly see more. So this was an off-Broadway play, and then it hit Broadway. Got it. 
And it was off Broadway because it was copyright free. Well, I do like to. You do? You really do? You like to kiss me? Yeah, I do. Would you like to kiss me again? Okay. That plant? <laughs> He's so good. Oh, boy, you kiss good, Audrey. Well, you know, he uh, he also is a dead ringer for, for Lenny Bruce, don't you think? Would you like to go out on I can see Lenny Bruce night? in his Ready? face, oh, yeah. yeah. Seymour, anytime. Tonight? Okay. Oh, boy. Uh -oh. oh, boy. <laughs> okay, but for the romance, what about that killer plant? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuck on Audrey. Fuck on Audrey. Oh, there's the high schoolers that hang out on Skid Row. That's right. Now they've agreed. Yeah. Look at Miller. He just walks in. He's got like the untouched look. Power. Yeah. I got terrible news. Yeah. He died. Just lost his little boy. Oh, that's too bad. So I didn't play the audio when the cops were together. They're like, "How's your son? How's your family?" And he goes, "I lost a kid last night." He goes, "Really?" Yeah, playing with matches. And he goes, that's the breaks. And then Miss yeah, Shiva comes in and goes, Mike's my nephew's sons, they lost the playing with the matches. So it's pretty dark. Yeah, so Mel is doing a great job pretending. Why are you so nervous? You got a guilty conscience? No, why should I? Why should I? <laughs> this picture, Dr. Fogg. You no, know him? Maybe did something. There's appeared blood in his office. The other man too. Blood in the railroad tracks and few spare parts. Okay, but that hot doctor Farb is murdered. Is he? Is he? No, 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 I know. I don't know he was murdered. <laughs> he doesn't know anything. Okay, Mushnik. If you hear anything about these men, call our office. Sure, I'll be glad to cooperate with the police. <laughs> So he obviously knows everything, and then Joe Fink is like, he doesn't know anything. Bum, bum. They just did the gag with Miss Shiva. I'm so sorry about your son. What's going on, Seymour? And this finish all grown up. He's finished all growing up. You wouldn't kid your father. My father came home. Me, idiot. <laughs> a finger of speed. Now look. A I finger can't of stand speed. anymore that plant. It's growing me out of house and home. Well, it ain't gonna grow anymore, I promise. How can you be so sure? It ate three times already. Who? I mean... Doesn't he... Oh, can we get to the spoiler at the ending? I'm, I think I figured it out. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the plant eats him. Right? The plant uh, eats Seymour? Yeah. D do you really want me to ruin it? No, I guess not. We only got 20 minutes. I should know the ending. I, I mean, I'm familiar with this. I read the comic book. Okay. You're right, you're right, but he gets eaten with a knife in his hand. Oh, so he dies killing Audrey right. Jr. But the thing is, the film doesn't do a good job of showing us that the plant is dead, so you don't really know it. Oh, so it opens up for a sequel. You know, crime does not pay in the, in the 1950s. If you have a carnivorous human-eating plant, you will have to suffer. The, the, no, the, they are not setting themselves up for a sequel. So what's the deal with the Bucket of Blood trilogy? I, what was the third movie? I don't have any idea. I will watch Bucket of Blood for our next episode, and yep. that will begin my research, but I don't so, know a thing about the film. Carl, this is 12-year-old 12, 12 Mike from the library watching Roger Corman films. From what I recall from long ago, he made this movie as quickly as possible and then the same opportunity came with bucket of blood they were about to tear it down so he made another light kind of dark comedy horror comedy and there's apparently a third movie of that bane uh -huh. that he shot in a couple of days and they oh, consider that a trilogy it's called the trilogy right it's just called a trilogy because it was shot cheaply you know in the same style and same kind of humor well, Bucket of Blood came first. Now, this is a woman from like the Silent Flowers Appreciation Group. And she's got this weird name, Hortense. Wait. At any rate, I have the honor to tell you. Okay, I guess we passed it. It's okay. Fuchwanger. Fuch, Fuchwanger. And, and he mispronounces it and she corrects him. And it, I don't know, it's, it's a little bit funny. Um, okay. So he's going to get an award 
And he thinks that once he gets the award, he will be a famous horticulturist. So this is sure. his chance to, from be from a ne'er to do well to become somebody. That's all. Look at that! He's opening the door for her. It's fucking suck ass. <laughs> Kiss ass. Kiss ass. Oh boy, I'm gonna get a trophy. Oh, Caesar, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud. All he had to do was kill people. Now, Audrey is not jealous at all of these little teenagers. Like, okay, so they don't have any money, so they're having dinner. It's their first date, and they're having dinner with mom. Now, I got to tell you that mom is no slouch in terms of having a career. I mean, she had one little thing. Right. Okay, uh, her name is Myrtle Vale, and she is the mom, and she is the grandma, the writer. So... We counted her already. She was a hey, longtime resident of Hawthorne, New Jersey. Shout out. Um, Shout out. She was an American vaudevillian. She was a radio, radio star and a film actress and a writer. She was a radio fixture. This is her big thing. From 32 to 46, a soap opera called Mert and Marge. Oh. And she played like a retired 1920s dancer. And she'll call that back in here. So she doesn't, she deserves to be in this film. She's not just the grandmother of, okay, here comes Mushnik. Now, Mushnik is going to make sure nobody else dies, God damn it. So he's not leaving Seymour in charge of the plant overnight anymore. He's going to do it himself because nobody's dying under my watch. Glutton you. You glutton. I keep an eye on you. I don't let nobody get near you. What do you think is in his lunch bag? A gun. Oh, I thought it would be like a sausage. No, it's lunch. It's lunch. Is it kibasa? Uh, I think it's a pickle. Soup. I don't touch oh. it. Now, as you know, she's a hypochondriac. So the joke is everything she cooks, it's always medicine with Epsom salt and That's a lot of essence salt. Yeah. So Audrey's like, what is this? Cod liver oil. It's wonderful for the colon. And that's sulfur powder on top. Yeah. Cod liver oil. Okay, wait, you got to hear the. Feed me. Feed me. Talk. me. He goes, I didn't hear that. I heard that. We got a talking oh, plant that makes wise crap. He's doing stick. Yeah. It is kind of sitcom y, right? Like Ghost of Mrs. Muir. Did that the horse just talk? Spin me. I didn't hear it. Feed me. I heard it. Oh, I heard <laughs> it. <laughs> I want food. Talking plants we got. I'm hungry. Hungry and other fine kettles and fish. <laughs> Who would you like to have tonight? You look fat enough. Oh, it makes wise. Not only got a smart plan, we got one that makes with smart cracks. Smart cracks. What? You smart cracks. Me, you botanical bum. <laughs> Food you wouldn't get. Not from Gravis Mushnik. I'm starved. Excellent. You would unpopulate the old skid row. So he's. Yeah. Determine, I'm not giving you shit until he gets in trouble. Oh, and then he feeds the body into, into the plant. Now, do you remember earlier in the day we saw the writer? Yeah, right. He ran out of there. He had a trench coat. What he really is is a criminal. Okay, what are we eating now? Because it's made of Chinese herbs and it's flavored with acromyosin, Epsom salts. There ain't another cook in a whole world like my ma. So later they'll be together and he gets a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then Seymour is like, what does this cure? Because she's only a cook for medicine. She, she you know, so Seymour's whole life, he's been eating medicine. That's not bad. That's the way to do it. <laughs> See, he's like, what is that? It isn't any good unless it helps your colon. So, um. Earlier in the day, we saw the writer 
what he was was really a thief noticing all the business they're doing they must have money in the cash register oh so so he's the the writer comes in. whoa so the voice of the plant and the actor of the voice of the plant are going to be in the same room exactly so this, this makes sense. charles griffin let's get it for charles griffin i had no idea about this guy he would go on to write tens of movies. All right, you. you see, like I said, his grandmother was that semi-famous person on the radio show. So he moved to California. And the first thing he was going to write, he wrote, was like a movie for her that revived the soap opera. But it didn't hit. Oh, but... Yeah. Yeah. He was friends with Jonathan Hayes, who took a bunch of his scripts and just threw it on Corman's desk. And Corman liked it, cast him, and not cast him, but used it to make a film. And that's it. He was a Corman guy writing. You know, one thing about just cranking this movie out in 11 days, you know, you have the writer on the set, probably. Yes, about 30,000 people in here. They must have spent some money. Where is it? There ain't no more money. Not a good actor. On the plant, it's a big attraction. Audrey Jr. The plant, don't try to snow me, Jim. 30,000 squares didn't come in here just to look for a plant. I want it. I don't got no more money, honestly. <laughs> you know, I keep it in deep into the plant. That's right. That's right. Oh, Did you know that? Four. No, I ain't got no more money, honest. All right. Try it the other way around. Five, Five four, four, three. Okay. All right. All right, then. <laughs> It's in the plant. In the plant. Yes, in the giant oversized Venus flytrap. Inside the big leaf. That's right, inside. <laughs> so before uh, I said exploiting the actors, like indignant, but you're right. I only said that because you're always saying, like, look how they make them hang upside down. It's cruelty. Right. But you're right, actually. I, that's the only reason I was saying that, to, like, right. dispute you because of your mindset about it. But no. you're right. He shot this at the last second so we wouldn't have to pay people in the future. Oh, so it's ironic that it's, like, one of the biggest public domain movies in the world. Yeah, it's ironic that... He shot it to break the, then he never said fuck it. He never copyrighted it. Because he didn't copyright it, it became a big, big deal. And he gets known as the guy who birthed it. Right. Okay. Well, we, talking about, we talk about Corbin a lot. We watch Gas, another one of his films. But he, did a, he directed a movie called The Fast and the Furious about car yes. racing. And that but was it's what, just the title. They bought it. They bought the title from him. Okay, okay. You know, they, they did pay Corman for, for that title. So we saw Munchies, which he produced. He didn't direct both of them, two of them. We saw... We saw three Munchies. We saw all three Munchies? Oh, that's terrible. That's right. We Howard saw Munch, Nesman. Munchie, Howard Nesman. Munchie, and then Munchie 2. We also saw Grem... Not Grem... The Gremlin ripoff. Ghoulies. Go to college. Okay, but there was also one. There was Critters. We didn't watch we didn't Critters. We didn't see that. Uh, we also saw, of course, Fantastic Four. Well, a notorious Corman film. I, you know what? I'm thinking of Munchie. I'm thinking of the Munchies. That yeah. So you're right. We saw all three. Corman made it like a a Gremlins. R-rated comedy with with and then turn it into a kids film and we watched all I, three of these films. Now the one with Dom De Deloise was hilarious. At least his voice. It would no, it, it, that's not fair. It was a terrible film, but we enjoyed it on our thing. I thought the Howard Nesman one was what? What am I saying? He's from KRP. Howard Hessman. Hessman, right? It was Les Nesman. Howard Hessman. Howard Hessman. Oh, I can see right, that. Right, yeah, uh, I mean, we're watching Little Shop, but Munchies 2 was, was dire because the only returnable character was Munchie and the douchebag yeah. guy who tried to date the kid's dad in the last film. 
Right. But also the star of Munchies, the second one, was in the third one. Huh. In the beginning, in the beginning. And he was he was older. He was That's like I remember. Right. And they were showing explosion scenes of the high school that was from another movie. All right. Is this the last of the mom? Um, no, we'll see her again. It was kind of a forgettable scene. She's just paranoid about Audrey getting married to Seymour and you promised to buy me an iron lung. Your lungs are fine, mom. And for now. So this is, remember I pointed out there was a dumb non-realistic thing about the hobo who got killed at the train station, right? Right, yeah. Here's the next one that doesn't make sense. The plant starts talking. And he wants to hide from Audrey that the plant is, I don't know, sentient or... I don't know why he wants to hide that the plant eats people. And so he pretends that it's him and that he's a ventriloquist. So, so they're, they're about to kiss. kiss. And then the plant says, hey. Fuck me. I was just kidding. Right. I'm hungry. For sex, for sex. Yeah, I'm hungry for sex. You didn't even say that. Oh, yes, I did. I said it. I said it. Oh, I'm looking right at you. Well, I'm a ventriloquist. You're what? A ventriloquist. Hey, me. Look at that. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, then stop all this nonsense and kiss me. I'm dying from hunger. All right, if you're so hungry, eat something. But forget about me. I'm sorry. Oh. Give me to eat. You can't control yourself. I'm going home. I need some chow. Oh. Some chow. Now, I don't understand why he wants to keep it a secret from her. Like, why wouldn't he tell her? Sure. At least the talking part. Yeah, listen, you know that plant we named after you? eats people and talks okay maybe it makes sense why he wants to keep it a secret from her because it's a horrible because then i don't know i don't know i don't know it's basically i'll tell you all the truth later then i'll talk to you good night seymour So, oh no! Now he's mad at the plant. You're fucking up my love life. Okay, I'm not feeding you anyone. I'm sick of you or whatever. Now the third stupid thing, in my opinion, occurs in this film. He hypnotizes Seymour, and he does it in two seconds in an unbelievable way. Yeah, I don't. I bought everything about this movie until the plants hypnotized me. All them high class fertilizers and sat up all night with you when you were sick. Well, we're suspending this belief, so we're with the film. This one strays. Darn right they wouldn't. Well, I've helped you, and you've helped me. Now shut your trap and go to sleep. I'm tired. Damn. Now here comes the hypnotism. You are asleep. Close your eyes. Now this is the writer talking. Sure. He's got a lot of rage, gravelly and nondescript voice. Yes, master. That's it. Yes, that's it. It doesn't make sense. So now he's sending him out to find him food. I'm Carl laughing at someone else's joke. You're, I forget where it came from, but someone gets hypnotized. And he goes, yes, master. He goes, I'm not your master. I wish I could remember what that was from. Now, this Ooh. all is Skid Row paid actors 10 cents a piece. To be in this, watch. Oh, look at the bug. You, did you see the VW yeah. bug? 50s okay. Bucks. Now, this is Mel Wells' real life wife, and she's playing a prostitute. Now, look, she does the old drop the hanky gag, and he sure. doesn't fall for it. So now, this is her again. It's comedic. Mm. Now, look at her. She'll wiggle her butt. Hmm. Hmm. She'll try again. But she listen, in true butt. fish burgers fashion, uh -oh. she'll drop a banana peel. True fish burgers. 
He's hypnotized. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. I'm Lenora Clyde. My name is Leonora Clyde. How's the rain? <laughs> this movie does not quit, right? It could just run out of space as time. You're like, let's get this prostitute in there. <laughs> well, the thing is, he's hypnotized, and she's obviously trying to solicit him for money. Yeah. Okay, watch this. You see his eyes blink? Yeah. I missed this gag every single time I watched it until yesterday, my last prep of this film. I finally caught that gag. It's clever. He's he's blinking to the light. Right. He does not know how park benches work. I remember from my days in LA, this park bench. Oh, it yeah. It was... <laughs> Uh, it was, oh, yes, it was the Bunker Hill Avenue overlooking the lights of Third Street. Oh, I remember. Oh, yeah, the lights of Third Street. So he, she's trying to solicit him. He is hypnotized. So he thinks that she's volunteering to get eaten. Oh, boy. Right. That's, 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 now, that's, it takes a while for it to fall into that, but it does. So he has to get her to the Skid Row florist? Ooh. <laughs> yes. That's more like it. Kiss me. What's the matter? Would you like me? Too bony. Too, Too bony. bony? Nobody ever told me that before. Beef is better than veal. Ah, oh, you're such a dodo. What do you call this? Chopped liver? That's beef. Mm. <laughs> Master would like more fat. Speak for yourself, John. John? John? Seymour. How would you know my name? Seymour. That's my name, too. Are you... Did you get that joke? Yes, finally, he did a Seymour joke. Do you volunteer? Sure, I do. All right, if you're sure you want to volunteer. I'll... Okay, so he goes... My she goes, Hey, John, like you know, prostitute has a John. Prostitute, she goes, my yeah. name is Seymour, and she goes, My name is Seymour, and he goes, Hey, that's my name. Oh, I thought it was like a Seymour ass or something like that, right? Watch, bonk, bonk. Oh, no, master's not gonna like this. No, master is gonna like it, master's gonna eat, but she, she's bony. Yeah, I know, but she did volunteer. You're right. You're right. It won't Look at that there. view. God damn. What's it say? The Skid Row Cemetery. Right. Depressing. Ah, the old Impressive. Pioneer Cafe. You said impressing. Now, this is an interior. It just looks yeah. like an exterior. Mushnik. Please. He will have an award today. Nobody should come in for the award. I can't. Oh, are these the teenagers? Yeah. I tell you, this business is now, always been being a conductor you, in a revel. You see how mom is dressed? Yeah. That's an homage to her character in the radio show. She was like a flappers dancer. I love it. We had a helicopter. You. I'll explain everything after the session. Cops are here! Why are cops are you here? Hey, there was something going on here this evening. Just thought we'd come by and keep an eye on things. Look, we don't need no eyes kept on nothing. Everything. Wait, wait, the society is silent. <coughs> Our observers has arrived and sunset is almost upon us. Welcome, lady and gentlemen. We are honored for to have you. Still working on those This is it. This is the big plant plan veil. Look here, young man. That's no way to talk at a time like this. Let me see your tongue. Mm-hmm. And what you got? Just the facts, ma'am. Trench mouth. Just the facts, ma'am. Now, I think you educated me about trench mouth. Yeah, that's a World War One thing. Yeah, she goes, trench mouth. I had that in the big hot four, whatever that means. Well, I mean, it was, they built trenches in, in 1916, 17, 18, right? During World War One. So it was prior to that. Look at your son and we see more. It's opening. Holy cow. Look. Oh, right. That's right. The faces of the, the victims. Right. 
Now, there's speculation that this was written like from a story by Arthur C. Clarke. And like they never say like none of the people who wrote this film ever talk about it. But there was this um, uh, it was there's this story called Green Thoughts. And in it, the carnivorous plant, the faces of everyone showed up in the buds. So maybe it's true. There were three short stories this could have been based on. But the writer never admits that or talks about that. And that Clark story was written prior to the movie uh, in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was 1956. So that's kind of close, right? It could have right. come out. And he write them. It was called The Reluctant Orchid. 1894, The Flowering of the Strange Orchid by H.G. Wells. And Green Thoughts, 1932. Where's he um, going? Okay, he's just running away because he thinks but he's is that a subway station? Now, five cents a piece. Five cents a piece. We hired these kids to run out of the subway. Oh, five right. Cents five cents. They didn't even get 10 cents like the adults. That's right. They did not get 10 cents like the adults. He exploited them. He exploited them. Quick, quick before his 1960 run. Yeah, in 1960, you have to give them six cents a piece. Okay, so like I told you before, they gave two bottles of scotch to the night watchman. He goes, go ahead, you can come in. Film all your shit. <coughs> two bottles of scotch. Whoa, that's going to last that's me good. like a month. No, that's like one shit night shift right there. Yeah. What? No, you can't. Maybe you're right. Maybe you can drink a whole bottle of scotch in a night. And then have a little topper with the second one. Okay, so what this we're really going right now is just a chase. Chase, chase, chase. In which they think you're... But the thing is, he's not a murderer, right? The he's... one got hit by a train. The dentist was trying to kill him. Uh, he was hypnotized for the prostitute. He was hypnotized. I mean, he probably... was... Uh, I guess he legit killed the dentist. I guess he legit, even though it was self-defense. Now, he, there's he only the one funny... Okay, you see how Mushnik's tired? Yeah. That's kind of a funny gag. But Mushnik will now do the second hilarious gag in a minute. All right, I'm ready. Look, look at that sea of tires, man. I know. It's, I, like As I said, it's tiresome. Ha <laughs> ha! Very good. Very good. Yeah. The guy who invented tires thought of it one morning. He was just having donuts and coffee. Watch this. Trip him. But he gets away. But by... Whoa! <laughs> he tripped the cops. By a mistake. I don't know. I yeah. thought that was hilarious. I'm trying to figure out, like, the location. The location is... Oh, well. It probably doesn't exist now. Uh, I, I can't find it. Yeah. Okay, so he's hiding in the toilets, and now we're about to see, really, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill will lift his head out of the toilets. M Mushnik's like, forget it, you don't find him in the toilets. <laughs> hey! You wouldn't find him here with the toilets. Let's with the toilets. Finish. Now, why do they listen to him? They got a murderer. Yeah, they're cops. They're not like taking advice from a florist. Now watch Mark Hamill. Hey, yeah, no, you're right. The same nose, the same eyes. Yeah. And this movie has everything in the kitchen sink. Look at this colorization; it's gorgeous. Yeah, it is. This is why I picked this version. There are many choices. In '87, I think it was, they released a colorized version. And it wasn't as good. Now, look, he's got the knife. He goes into the plant. He knows he's going to get eaten, I guess. Yeah. Now, he somehow killed the plant, but we really can't see it. Why would come mom on, come back here with Audrey? Corbin, spend some money on the finale. Does he look dead? He doesn't look dead to me. Better to give up, Judson. You wouldn't find him tonight. Look. 
The door's open, Frank. Oh. Uh. Now, is the plant dead? It doesn't look very dead. No, I think the plant's still alive at the end, honestly. Now, there's Seymour. It is. Seymour. I didn't mean it. He spoke? Ian or Ian. or Kronos plug into the afterlife and I hate that. I hate that. Carl, what's the think of this movie? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I love this. I love this movie. It's one of the reasons why I love Roger Corman. It's uh definitely like just a lot of spirit. And you know, I was talking crap, but the fact they made this movie so quickly and yeah. that the humor is so on point. It, it's really he's a funny guy. Like Corman, we watch gas with a bunch of S's. Mm -hmm. He reminds me of like Q Hefner trying to do comedy. Sometimes he really <laughs> kind of he hits, right? He nails it. And then the other times it's like, uh. Well, he yeah, nailed it with Fantastic Four movie. It was cheap and horrible and terrible. And it was also great with a great plot. I think Mushnick was hilarious in this film. I think Dick Miller was. I think there was lots of funny things in, about it. And um, it's, it's, it's so not many nice. funny roles. Yeah. Right? The, the mom, uh, Nicholson, the, the dentist, they all kind of kill it. Yeah. Uh, it's good. So I, I'm going to share my screen because I want to play. Uh, we can't talk about Little Shop of Horrors without bringing up uh, these awful fucking ads. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All now right. this was for the Broadway one. It must have been because they had a budget. It was, or was it off Broadway? It was off Broadway. I, I always think it's Broadway just because they would always, always play, uh, you know, commercials. All right, here we go. Little Shop of Horrors presents its audience. Kinky. I thought it was really amazing. Beautiful. It's a birthday present for my son. He's twelve. It spans the spectrum of all ages. We like it so much that we brought our whole family this time. I liked it a whole lot. Little Shop of Horrors is the greatest play in the universe. It's better than Gremlins. Better than E.T. It's one of the most Whoa. Enjoyable plays I've seen in a very long time, and I have a great feeling about it. I really do. Call two three nine six two hundred for tickets. Don't call that number. Okay, so better than Gremlins, better than E.T. Yeah, wow. One man's yeah. opinion. That's that's a big opinion, but that opinion haunted me for a while. Now, last once time. again, if this film was not in the public domain, it would have never became an off-Broadway play and would have never became the movie and would have never became the commercial, you know. Yeah. Oh, no, I hear you, man. And thank God they made the movie and the play so they were able to get that copyright, you know, make some money off of it. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Well, that's exciting. So uh, we already tipped our hat. Next week, we'll be watching Corman's other quickie, Bucket of Blood. Bucket of Blood. The great Dick Miller. So we hope to see you next week. Check us out. We subscribe to our podcast, L-W-A-F-L-M-O-Y-T. Subscribe to us on YouTube, L-W-A-F-L-M-O-Y-T. Listen to us on mutinyradio.fm. Every Sunday, 2 p.m., as long as the station is running, we're there, baby. We love the station. Keep that station running. Go to the website, donate some money, share the love, and we'll see you guys. Thank you, Carl, so much. That was really great. You you told me stuff I didn't even know. I really appreciate it. I love, I love watching that movie. Nailed it. We'll be back next week. Carl, see you guys later. Michael Siegelman